Attention, due to the nature of the films discussed, the Civil Gore podcast may contain adult language and themes. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to episode five of the Civil Gore podcast. Yes, five. It's, it's an anniversary, I guess. Yeah, we made a whole five whole episodes. Yes, this is good. Cool. So in Friday the 13th terms, that's a new beginning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But we're not going to change the format too much on you. No, not not much of a beginning. However, we are going to get uh, a little more modern with the movie. Yeah, we decided to uh, go a little bit more modern this time since we've been kind of stuck in the 70s and early 80s. What I wanted to talk about for this first chop was I, like you, Brian, am a big Blu-ray collector. <laughs> although not quite as big as you. Yeah. Because I, I just recently started. I had a... When DVDs first came out, I started buying them as soon as DVD players came on the market back in 98, maybe? 97, 98? Yeah, I was there. I did the same. <laughs> yeah, so I had, at one time, I had probably four or 500, maybe more, uh, DVDs. And then over the years, I, I just started getting rid of all... I went through the phase of getting rid of media as things went more digital and... Only recently, when I started getting back in horror films, did I start getting back into Blu-ray. So my Blu-ray collection is fairly small. But what I've decided to do was to keep myself from getting back to a 600-disc collection. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to watch them as I buy them. Uh. And currently, I've not been doing a good job of that because I have about 40 in my backlog. <laughs> so my project for uh, starting this week was to start going through that backlog. And every day at lunch go through and watch at least half of a movie and i'm i'm a bit of a perfectionist i like to watch the movie all the commentaries all the extras everything so i'm a completist yeah see that that's your backlog right there <laughs> yeah exactly but it, it just bugs me to own a disc and not have seen everything on it so uh, i just finished up the halloween box set which has all of the halloween films in it great box set by scream factory and the most i've ever spent on any blu-ray collection yeah that that as far as as sets go that has got to be not just horror but any kind of uh set for a complete series of films because they they have everything including the producer's cut of halloween six which for a while was was unheard of without being a bootleg yeah so i bought this set about a year ago and I've just gotten around to finally completing all of it. I took a little break there between uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 and his Halloween 2. So this week I decided to sit down and watch Halloween 2, the Rob Zombie version. And I did not remember anything about this movie. I know I saw it. So I was looking forward to seeing it because I'd heard mixed reviews. Some people hate it. Some people really like it. And I thought I, I liked a lot of the aspects of the of his first Halloween I did not care for the Michael Myers backstory stuff because I'm a purist who thinks that his origin does not need to be explained. He's scarier as just the boogeyman. And when you start adding in, he's a kid and he wears rock and roll t-shirts and all this stuff. It just, it just takes all the mystery out of him. Right. You get to know him too well and you don't want to know him. In fact, the originals, you knew him through hearing it from Loomis. And that was the gr a great way to, to get to know him. Yeah. So the Halloween two, I was hoping he would tone that down when in fact he doubled down on it and he made it even worse. And it's filled with these silly, silly dream sequences where it shows his mom and the stupid white horse and the kid or him as a kid. And it was just, oh man, every time that came on the screen, I just cringed because it was just taking, robbing Michael Myers of every sense of mystery. And then on top of that, he spends most of the movie without his mask on. And he looks like this just bearded hobo guy. And it just, oh, it, it really infuriated me. Like I hated this movie. Yeah. And in fact, that's, that. It, it's funny. Those things you mentioned were what I remember about it. And there were some elements of it that were 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 good that I liked, but other but those two things that with the, all the imagery, which works in a non-Halloween movie, would be great. But for a Halloween movie, and the fact that yeah, I hated the fact that he's wandering around just like this big bearded, bushy man guy. That's not Michael Myers. Michael Myers is the mask. Is the it, it just yeah? I I just. 
to me that was that was almost insulting to to the franchise. Yeah. I, I don't even know. I don't even know how he got that beard in the mask. Yeah, right. <laughs> he has this giant Hagrid beard. Yeah. And he's trying to cram into this little mask. But I watch. I even watched the. I finished the commentary today, and Rob Zombie, to his credit, he defended his choices and he said, "Look." This is my Michael Myers. This is my take on it. And in my take on it, he's a real person. He's a real man. I've taken the supernatural elements out of it. And so that's why I didn't mind showing his face. And that's his decision. So I respect that. But it was funny because I was watching the bonus disc and it had a featurette on the making of the original Halloween. And it had John Carpenter on there talking about Michael Myers and how he believed the exact opposite, that the less you knew, the scarier it was. So it just showed me, it infuriated me even more because it showed that he was going in direct opposition to John Carpenter. And he's the daddy of this film. So when you go in direct opposition of that, it, you just lose my respect. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have nothing against him putting his, his mark on it. But yeah, it's like spitting in the face of... A, a true legend of horror there with John Carpenter, you know? <laughs> yeah, and before anybody gets the wrong idea, I love Rob. Oh, Zombie. I, I, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I don't have anything against him. Like, I love Devil's Rejects. I loved House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, those, 31 was okay. I haven't seen that I, I yet. Yeah, crazy. I, I got to yeah. see 31. It, I wasn't a huge fan, but I respect his, I, I love his passion for the uh, Grindhouse movies. I, I love his music. I was listening to his music long before he ever started making movies. So uh, I have nothing against him personally whatsoever. Uh, and every new movie he comes out with, I, I, I'm, I definitely seek it out. But uh, this one just missed the mark for me. And it's because I love the franchise so much. I just couldn't stand to see that take on it because I felt like it wasn't true to the original franchise yeah no yeah i agree and i i feel the same about rob zombie i loved i loved house of a thousand corpses that's actually one of my favorites and and yeah devil's reject was was a great sequel because it actually did it in a different style so you, you got to see a lot of different styles of rob zombie with the between the two films so i actually i'm looking forward to watching 31 even though it didn't get the greatest reviews but i still do want to see it because i like to see what he does but yeah so i think we're in agreement on halloween too uh. <laughs> yeah so i mean that was my rant i'm not i don't, I don't usually come down really hard on movies because i try to find something good in in everyone and the, and to be honest there's some great stuff in this one brad dorif is amazing in this yes one. yeah um one of the other things i mentioned i didn't like was i didn't like how he made Lori this unlikable drug addled character she was unlikable through most of the movie and then you have loomis he turns into this selfish greedy guy that's exploiting michael for his own ends and it was completely again completely contrary to the loomis character that we knew and loved right yeah i didn't yeah i i didn't i didn't like that you know laurie was unlikable because jamie lee curtis was likable i didn't like that loomis was a you know like a, you know really not a, a good you know was, it, he just wasn't a, a loomis he was yeah you're right he was just exploiting everything that you know he wasn't hunting him down like donald pleasance was and now the thing about laurie strode is that the the, fu the fact that they made her kind of messed up makes sense she was through a lot and you know that's fine but yeah to make her unlikable uh yeah that that part i didn't yeah make her messed up but make you make you have some sympathy for her and i had no sympathy for her in this movie no you didn't you were like oh, good for, good for her <laughs> you know it's like so anyway, that's my that's my soapbox for Rob Zombie's Halloween Two. But I can't say enough nice things about the set. It's it's freaking awesome. I love 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 love. It. That's my most cherished Blu-ray right now. Is that set? Yeah, it it's it was it was worth every penny. I think. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Even though it comes and with Halloween Two, but uh... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yes, Rob Zombie's Halloween Two. The, the other one's a classic. Yes, the original Halloween Two is 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 great. And so I watched another. You know, Shudder, I'm going to sing the praises of Shudder again. I swear they are not paying us no, royalties. No, no. They fo we, we, they are we follow them on Twitter, so hopefully they'll they'll see us talk about them one of these days. But I will not stop talking about Shudder because I love it so much. But Shudder, like I said before, is great for finding these little gems that you had no idea existed. And so I was, I was messing around there and I saw a new release or a new film that they had just put on the service called Burial Ground. And it was a 
70s Italian zombie film, which I'm a sucker for. I'm like, oh, yeah, I gotta see this. And it was directed by, and I'm gonna mess this name up because I don't speak Italian, <laughs> Andrea Bian- Bianchi? I, that's how I would say it because uh, I, I knew someone with that last name before and that's okay. how they, that's how it was said so i think you might have but, it <laughs> so this group of well-to-do individuals and there's there's really no plot to speak of in this movie the, this group of well-to-do individuals gather at this this estate and it might have even been a castle now that i think about it and unbeknownst to them there a professor has dug up some sort of artifact or something underneath the castle that causes the dead to rise hmm. from their graves so they spend the movie under attack by these waves of zombies. And even though there's no plot to it and the dubbing is absolutely horrendous, there is something about this movie that I absolutely loved. The zombies are, it's a weird take on them. They're very crude, uh, but they're really cool looking. I mean, jaws dislocated and maggots crawling out of their eyes. and Nice. Uh, it was it was really neat. It has that old Fulci style zombie feel to it, and there's this actor in there. His his Americanized name is Peter Bart, <laughs> and he is. I don't know why I looks, laughed at that. I'm sorry. <laughs> he looks like a kid. He's an adult. Uh, apparently, he is an adult, but he has the stature of a kid. He's not a little person. He has a proportionally stature of a child, hmm. but he's a grown man. And so what they did is they used that to their advantage so that they could do these weird, creepy incest scenes with him and his mother, or the actress who plays his mother. So you'll see some of the weirdest, creepiest incest stuff in this movie that you've ever seen in your life. You know, that's two weeks in a row now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've I mentioned swear, that. I don't, seek, I don't seek these yeah. out. Yeah, well, well but, yeah, I mean... Yeah, technically, Night, Night Warning was, was Bill Paxton's fault, really. So that's it had nothing to do with the topic <laughs> while we came up with that last one. Just yeah. a weird coincidence, I guess. But uh, some really creative death scenes. Uh, I don't know. You, you need to check this one out. Brian. I know. I think it's I will. It's really, really fun. It's a fun movie. I, lo- I loved it. Yeah, no, I, I will now, actually. And, well, that's, you know, I watched Castle Freak based on your... your uh, your weekly uh, review there so and i and i and that that paid off so i think i will have to check this one out yep give it a shot it's really fun yeah and i almost forgot i didn't put this on the rundown but i actually watched something on shutter once again praise for uh shutter i watched one of their uh, i guess they had an original uh exclusive called always shine it's kind of a, a it's a psychological uh thriller horror movie that they put on there. I don't really want to go into too much of the plot because it's you know with, with when you tend to discuss too much about a psychological thriller, you tend to give stuff away. So it's just the basic plot it's just there's two best friends and they do a weekend trip to a cabin and you know, they're both actresses. I guess one's more successful than the other, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, it's it's interesting. It, well, I wasn't super super, you know, impressed with it. I thought it was it was good. It was watchable. I mean, it held my interest. It's not very long, which is a good thing. But I mean, you know, it, and it's on Shutter, so it was one of their exclusives. So I gave it a shot, and it it's not bad. So you so you know you look if you like those psychological thrillers, that's one to check out. It's got um. Uh, Mackenzie Davis, uh, she was in, uh, she's been a couple of, uh, different, uh, movies, some comedy movies. Uh, she was in an episode of Black Mirror, and it looks like she's coming up in the new Blade Runner she's gonna be in there. So, and she was in The Martian, so she's had some, some, some roles that you'll recognize her from, although she looks kinda creepy in this a little bit. But, um, and then also Caitlin Fitzgerald is, uh, the other woman where she was, I guess her big thing is, uh, Masters of Sex she's in. I don't know. I don't. I haven't watched that show, but she's in that and uh, movie. It's complicated with uh, Meryl Streep and Alec Baldwin. So, but uh, yeah. So there's there's one for uh, Shutter if you want to check out. And then um, the uh, I did watch. Uh, <laughs> I did actually watch Ape 3D. <laughs> in, oh man! In anticipation for my uh, for seeing Kong, uh, I, there could not be two more different films. <laughs> <laughs> besides let me guess made. which one was better yeah <laughs> and uh i'll tell you we definitely do need to review ape 3d though on the show as i think that will be a lot of fun to discuss on it's how many times it misses is just 
any type of movie, but <laughs> it's yeah, it's, we'll save that one. Yeah, then. I don't want to go into too much other than uh, than it's it's just there's so much to and, and you know basically he all those things it says on the box he he does. <laughs> but uh, just not well i guess and it doesn't look good but it's yeah. it's definitely worth a watch and it's enjoyable i did not watch it in 3d i don't have a 3d tv but uh my my parents have one at their house so maybe i'll have to bring it and watch it in 3d see if that makes it even worse but uh <laughs> yeah well tell us about the good gorilla movie yes yes again. so i as as we mentioned on the uh, previous show tim and i are both huge huge king kong fans so i know uh i knew when this was coming out i i, I couldn't wait to see it the trailers looked awesome so i you know I, a couple of days before i got us uh, got my wife and i some uh tickets to go see it and you know it, now we did not see it in 3d which i'll get to later um uh, julie's not a big 3d person uh kind of yeah it, it, she just doesn't like the whole thing she wears glasses so i think that kind of bothers her a little bit on it but um it doesn't i'll tell you it doesn't need to be in 3d but anyway so we got we got our showtime and based on the showtime uh we really did not have time from when i got home from work to have dinner but this theater we went to it's it, it seems like it's leaning towards the alamo draft house style where they kind of put these uh I hate to say gourmet, but <laughs> that's what they're calling it, uh, meal options, where you actually can order, like, burgers, uh, they even have sushi and and stuff, and they'll bring that part to your seat for you. So, funny enough, I didn't realize the coincidence, but we ordered this uh, burger there they called the Royal, or Royale, depending on if they want to get really movie-like, you know, non of Pulp Fiction, and the burger actually <laughs> had, uh, it had bacon and brie as the cheese on it, which is kind of funny, since... Brie Larson stars in King Kong. Totally unintended, but it worked. <laughs> well, that's your food pairing. Yeah, there's my food pairing. That worked out great. So they are building a bar there, but I don't think it's going to have the the options of beer that the Alamo Draft House had, which was immense of local beers. I think they're just going to have probably a handful, and it's probably going to be pretty much name beers. So, but it's beer. And it's in a movie, so it'll it'll be a plus. But so anyway, back to that. Wait, there's my my food pairing anyway, and a little mention of what's coming. So we brought our, our we got our meal brought to us. So I I was in 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 good spirits. I had my nice meal, getting ready for this movie. And let let me tell you, from the moment this thing starts, it just it just grabs you, and it's it's incredible. I I have not I really can't say one bad thing about this. I don't want to go into too much detail obviously. Tim hasn't seen it yet and I don't know how many people out there have seen it yet, but just I mean from the cast which is phenomenal. I mean listen listen to the cast it has alone. I mean you got John Goodman, Tom Hiddleston, Sam Jackson, Brie Larson and John C. Riley and I, I don't think I mentioned this on the show but pretty much I'll see anything with John C. Riley in it because I think he's just amazing and whatever he does for I mean, whatever role they put him in yeah i'm a huge fan as well yeah so i mean how are you going wrong with that cast so and and all the performances are great the, the main thing i want to mention um is the visuals and scope of this movie were astounding I, the fantastic it had fantastic cinematography by larry fong he was the uh the, the director of photography on it he's done uh you know, in the cinematographer, he's done Batman versus Superman. He did actually Super 8, Steven Spielberg. He did uh, 300. So he, he's definitely got a, a good resume of some things there. But, I mean, it was amazing because Kong was, was huge. And you felt how huge he was. And and seeing it on a big screen was just perfect. And, you know, uh, you know, as, as typical Kong movies have, there are other monsters in there. They were all awesome. And basically, basically the best way I could describe it, everything that should be in a Kong movie was in there and it it's one you definitely have to see in the theater i think just to get that full scope of the size of of kong and the island and everything in it and you could tell like the audience was in it too which was great they were into it and they applauded at the end and it's like i said i i mean i just without giving away super details i just i cannot recommend it any stronger to go see this movie and i will say this though make sure you stay Till through all the credits, uh, until after the credits, it's worth it. I will not say what, but trust me, it's worth it. We're going to try to see it next weekend because that new theater is opening right down the street. Oh, right, right. You were saying and that. And yeah. they're saying supposedly one of the theaters, at least one of the theaters, is going to have some kind of crazy, I don't know, 4K laser projection thing. I don't know. It, 
it sounded cool. Maybe it's all marketing gimmick, but it, it could be. It'll be on that screen. Yeah, uh, but I'm telling you, you if you you're a, like me, you're a Kong fan, you will not be disappointed for one second in that movie. Cool. I cannot wait. Yeah, I, it's like I actually want to go see it again, and now I do want to try and see it in the IMAX or 3D because I can't even imagine. I mean, the scope looks so good on just a regular screen, so I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go see it on whatever the top end IMAX 3D whatever whatever they have at that theater uh, that's what I'm going for oh nice nice yeah I, I can't wait to hear your reaction to it so <laughs> so let's get right into the disc membermint for March 21st yes uh well we can run through these pretty quickly because I don't know a lot about any of these yeah I was looking at through them I think I heard of maybe one so <laughs> yeah so if the first one is Frankenstein Created Bikers. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, that was one of those 70s movies. But it's actually a, a 2016 film. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I just looked at that, too. I assume yeah, that's it looks like it's a... Uh, I put uh, Modern Grindhouse in the notes, because that's what it looks like they're kind of going for, that style. Mm. And what I found interesting is it stars Lawrence R. Harvey, which you may know of Human Centipede 2 and 3. Oh, so you know what? I actually have only seen the first Human Centipede, but I have heard the name, so... Yeah, he's the he's the real creepy guy that stars in the second one. He's got a fairly big role in the third one as well. Oh, is that like the the chubby guy? Yes. Oh, yes. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but uh, so I want to read the description of this one. It says an outlaw biker finds himself addicted to a diabolical substance and hunted by a grenade tossing femme fatale, bounty hunters, law enforcement, a rival motorcycle gang, mutations, and a topless stripper hit squad. Hmm. You always got to throw in that topless stripper hit squad if the other people can't catch him you know because <laughs> yeah so again you know again i fall victim to shameless marketing i definitely want to see this yeah <laughs> i know now i do too now that i read your little review here your little uh, description i think i have to see this now you had me at topless stripper hit squad yeah i'm not gonna lie that definitely swayed me a little bit but you know <laughs> i guess <laughs> so moving right along we have other madnesses other madnesses 2015, a reclusive tour guide becomes an unlikely vigilante when the dark underbelly of New York City is revealed through his dreams. You know, by that description, it actually sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> it sounds more like psychological thriller, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't sound like a, a, a definitely a super gory horror movie by any means. But uh, this one looks interesting to me. Evolution, 2015. The only residents of young Nicholas's seaside town are women and boys. When he sees a corpse in the ocean one day, he begins to question his existence and surroundings. Why must he and all the other boys be hospitalized? It almost sounds like a bizarre Truman show. <laughs> yeah, uh, kind of interesting. Yeah. And then we have some, uh, some more classics. We've got Chamber of Horrors from 1940, starring Leslie Banks and Lily Palmer. A murderer is found to be connected to a false heir in a secret underground torture chamber. Hmm. Sounds like a Scooby-Doo episode. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I may have seen this one. Yeah, that one yeah, sounded familiar to me on the list. That was the one I saw, I thought I knew, but I may have seen this one on TCM or something. Yeah, that looks that's like that's got that, that. That's like the perfect movie for that channel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we have Invisible Ghost, 1941, with Bela Lugosi. Yes. Uh, the town's leading citizen becomes a homicidal maniac after his wife deserts him. I've never actually seen this one. No, I haven't either. I, I believe is... I heard of it, but I have heard of it. Uh, but as big a fan as I am of of him, I have, I just haven't caught that one. It was slipped through the cracks. The the, so, the title is kind of redundant, but you know, Invisible Ghost. I guess yeah, it's not <laughs> as good as the Ghost in the Casket. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that's the movie me and Brian are going to fund. Yes, on kick a Kickstarter. Yes, we need we need to <laughs> we, we, <laughs> early early pre production. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, we have multiple maniacs. Uh, 1970, John Waters, written and directed, starring Divine. So you know this one's crazy. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's that's uh, typical John Waters' resume right there. Written, yeah, directed, Lady... and starring Divine. <laughs> yeah, Lady Divine becomes enraged when her boyfriend cheats on her and descends into a life of murder and mayhem. So Lord knows what that movie. Yeah, like. that that that's that's yeah, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> uh, the theatrical releases, one that looks interesting, although the reviews have been a little, little mediocre uh the belco experiment and this one was written this has got some chops behind it written by james gunn who did guardians of the galaxy 2 slither dawn of the dead remake and directed by greg McLean, who did wolf creek rogue in the darkness oh okay uh it's got michael rooker from walking dead fame 
uh, in a twisted social experiment, 80 Americans are locked in their high-rise corporate office in Bogota, Colombia, and ordered by an unknown voice coming from the company's intercom system to participate in a deadly game of kill or be killed. And I actually saw the trailer to this one in front of Get Out. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looked really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I like the premise, sort of a Lord of the Flies in an office building type thing. Yeah, or like, uh, what's the, what's the one? Uh, uh, I know what you're Battle, talking about. Battle Royale, right? Battle Royale, yeah. yeah. So we'll see. Uh, the The early reviews have been kind of all across the board, so I'm not sure. I may, may catch this one on video instead of theatrical, but. Uh, looks interesting. Yeah, and, and you know, then, I, it's funny you said that real quick. I actually spotted, a th- as going through our, our Twitter page, that, that movie has come up a lot on people that we that I have us uh, following on there. So it, it's definitely getting a lot of uh, word of mouth. So I think I want to – I definitely want to check this one out. Yeah, and this one kind of – this was – this next one kind of flew under the radar. It's called The Devil's Candy. And according to IMDb, it, it was filmed in 2015, but it's just now coming out. And it stars Ethan Embry, which my wife used to love Ethan Embry for some reason. I don't know why. But from when he was in Dutch and he was Ethan Randall? <laughs> I guess. Uh, when he was, he was in his younger stage. She, she just was a huge Ethan Embry fan. Yeah, well, he was. what was that show he did? He did a show, like Freaky Links or something, I think. Was that his show? There was a big show yeah. he was on that a lot of people loved when it came out. I don't remember much of it other than I think the title, but... I don't remember. That used to be her one, her celebrity one. Oh, uh, okay, would, okay. But anyway, uh, not anymore. But that, back in the day, and too bad uh, because you guys would have had something in common now because you know he did a horror movie now. And then <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this one's a struggling painter is possessed by satanic forces after he and his young family move into their dream home in rural Texas in this creepy haunted house tale. And this one's getting good reviews. Is it? I and it's funny. Yeah. I don't think I've heard of it until now. <laughs> yeah, like this one's kind of got some hype behind it, so I'll, I'll have to check this one out. I had never heard of it, but you know, for a split second, I went and looked at my shelf of blue ribbon, but it's the Devil's Dolls that I picked up one day, not the Devil's Candy. So I, maybe that they're all connected yeah. somehow. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the reason for the gap between. Apparently, it was 2015. And it's just now coming out. I don't know. The, I, in fact, I thought it was a different film when I first saw the imdb entry but it, it's apparently the same one it's usually not a good sign when something gets delayed that long but who knows nowadays yeah. so so that that's it for uh and those are those theatrical releases were for uh when this episode drops which was march 17th nice okay now we're ready to get into our deep cut so as promised we decided to go a little more modern yes and we went with a movie from last year entitled lights out yes and uh one of our our listeners actually uh uh my friend daniel and his daughter amaya they uh have listened to our show every week they always give me compliments on it and they had seen this together so basically they they do a father daughter whenever they uh go uh, spend a father daughter day together they tend to go see horror movies which is good so i knew he'd like the podcast right away so they uh had suggested we try and do something modern and this is one of the ones he suggested so as 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 you know tim and i say many times if you have a suggestion feel free to send it to us and we will we will uh uh review it so here we are with lights out well let me start by saying and brian knows this i am a very jumpy nervous person (laughs) in real life yes so even though i'm a grown-ass man i still scream like a little girl when i go through a haunt maze at a theme park yes and brian is brian has witnessed this yes firsthand i have a couple of times (laughs) and i blame my brother for scaring me often when we were younger he delighted in torturing me and scaring me and jumping out of things at me and it has pretty much scarred me for life so I do not like jump scares in movies. Mm, this, and this one had some. <laughs> this movie is nothing but jump scares. Yeah. Because <laughs> by its very definition, it is a creature that only appears when the lights are out, which means it's a movie about a creature that suddenly appears on the screen over and over and over. So I really didn't even want to see it in the theater and managed to wait until it came out on blu-ray and then i watched it and then of course i watched it again in preparation for this show uh but just just a heads up not a jump scare fan (laughs) yeah so you you must have had a field day with this (laughs) yeah 
And, and you know, and I happened to see it in the theater for the first time, which was fun because the crowd that we saw it with was, uh, it was, uh, I, and it's funny because it was, a, I think it was like a Thursday night. And a couple of buddies of mine, we, we hadn't got together in a while, so we just went and uh, grabbed dinner. And this was the only movie that really uh, was feasible time-wise. So we saw this, this pretty, I think it was out for about a week or so. And so the theater was pretty packed, had a bunch of teenagers in it. And as obnoxious as they can be in, in normal movies, it's kind of fun to see <laughs> see a horror movie because every jump scare was was uh complimented by a scream or uh or, or you heard the reaction and so it kind of added to it and it kind of was uh pretty well, f- pretty fun to watch it <laughs> yeah that brings up a point and when when paranormal activity came out and i'm not a huge fan of paranormal activity and i believe the reason that is is because i did not see it in the theater originally uh it was getting such hype because i believe because of the audience reactions and the experience of seeing it in a theater with an audience who was on edge and watching it at home. You just didn't, you didn't have that tension there. Yeah. And I, I saw, I think I saw it three times the original in the theater it was I kept bringing different people to see it because <laughs> they, they were like, I, I was telling them how good it is. I'm like, you gotta, but you gotta watch it in the theater. I think you gotta really feel it. So they, they, I kept bringing different people to, to it. And yeah, it, it is definitely in the theater. I, and unfortunately I saw all the rest at home. And I think you're right. It didn't have the same impact. Yeah. Well, one of my, to prove, to prove a point from the other direction, one of my all time favorite horror movie experiences was with Jason goes to hell. Oh yes. Which is not, not a great movie, but because I saw it in the theater on opening night with a bunch of Friday the 13th fans, they just made it so much fun. I mean, I came out of that theater thinking that was the best Friday the 13th movie ever made. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> just based because of the audience reaction and it had nothing to do with the film now later when i saw it on video i was like oh okay so this movie's really not that great but it just goes to show what a good crowd can do uh for some of these movies and when i was watching lights out for the second time i realized then that if i had seen this in the theater i probably would have loved it much much more than i did watching it on blu-ray oh yeah and, and actually when we as we go through the movie there's a sequence where i'll mention actually that got a, a particularly uh interesting audience reaction too so when we get to that point i'll point that out it shows how yeah how sometimes a movie can be totally influenced in 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 the theater just a little bit before we get into the 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 meat of the of the whole film the way we do you know which will be uh spoiler filled of course but um i, I just want to mention uh the director david sandberg or David F. Sandberg, technically. He is pretty brilliant because he did a lot of short films, you know, including the original uh, Lights Out short film, which how I came to find out about him. Because uh, I, I remember it was on a Facebook post. Someone had had uh, shared it, and it said, oh, this is the scariest film ever. So, obviously, I was skeptical. I said, okay, yeah, let me see. Uh, while well, I, I don't know, I'd say scariest film ever, but I gotta tell you, it was pretty freaky, the original. If you have not seen that, I recommend it. But actually, as I went through, he has a lot of short films. He did. And it's funny, it's always uh, it's pretty much in the same apartment, and it's with his wife, Lada Lawson. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. And he he's in it a couple of times too. But he did a couple of short films, uh, actually more than a couple, but uh, one was called Closet Space. Uh, which, uh, just to give you a little topic, it's basically a, uh, woman finds that her closet multiplies objects. And, and now all his film, the, when I say short films, they're literally, I think his, the longest one was just over three minutes and his shortest was 14 seconds. And let me tell you, and I, and I, I'm kind of borrowing from a, a of a, a comment I saw on one of the, the video, uh, I think it was Vimeo that someone commented on one of the videos that <laughs> said, this guy has better uh, does better horror in two and a half minutes than most film full like feature films in horror and so and i gotta tell you i agree with some of that because he did one literally 14 seconds long 14 seconds and it had some one of the best scares and one of the best uh I mean, definitely not for Tim, because it's a, it's, a, it's a jump scare, essentially. But it's one of the best, it just, it had some of the best, just best visuals in a horror movie within that 14 seconds than some full-length feature film. And so that one was called, by the way, See You Soon, by the way. And um, 
but he did so he did the original lights out that one see you soon he did one closet space with the woman finds that her closet multiplies objects i'll just leave it at that then there was an attic panic which was another really good one where a woman gets locked in a storage attic and coffer which uh basically a woman is just in her apartment and she has a chest in the corner making noise and <laughs> opening a little bit and then there's one called not so fast where um basically she's just walking down a hallway the lights go off she sees the lit doorway at the end and every time she gets close to it it zooms and goes further away again and so and then there's one called pictured which was my favorite out of all the short films i can't recommend that one anymore that one's amazing so if you haven't seen that one yet check out pictured by him you can usually find these all on youtube yeah they're on youtube and vimeo I, I think okay. I watch him on Vimeo, and Vimeo, what it's got the advantage of is he's got a couple of little mini documentaries on how he made these, and it's kind of funny. He, there's one about how I guess they are they're from Sweden, I guess, and so he did. He said a lot of his props came from IKEA, which just I don't know made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and and they're so simplistic. They're mostly in the same apartment. They're they're just him and his wife and you know, occasional other actor or actress in there, but it's mostly them. And they are, like I said, I don't think the, I think the longest one may be just over three minutes and they're all pretty great. Oh, and there was one more. I'm sorry. It's called, uh, cam closer, little pun come closer, cam closer, which, uh, basically a woman's taking a picture with her cell phone. And as she looks into it, she kind of sees the, the future a little bit so almost sounds like a twilight zone but it's done and, and they're all done so well uh, if for, for such short films and such minimalistic techniques he uses it's amazing so uh, yeah it, uh, and so it's it's no wonder that he's now uh you know he's he's getting a feature film and i think his next one he's doing is annabelle too actually so he's obviously making it uh his way in horror here pretty uh pretty well so, and the the writer of this film was Eric Heisserer. Yeah, I'm not trying to pronounce and his name either. Not, yeah. yeah, I may have bur- I may have butchered that name as well, but he wrote Arrival, which is the uh, recently Oscar nominated movie, and the Thing remake and Final Destination Five. So it had a good good writing chops behind it yeah. as well. He did he did do the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, which. <laughs> He might have lost some okay. points there, but <laughs> yeah, okay. Well. But but his other, I mean, the arrival was amazing, and I I really liked Final Destination Five a lot. Um, the the thing remake I don't remember that well, which, but that's just you know that doesn't mean much <laughs> that I don't remember it. But yeah, so yeah, so he did he he definitely has is on his way to be coming an amazing horror director. I think <laughs> if he's not already based on his short films, but um. So, uh, yeah, it's got a good cast, too. It's got uh, Teresa Palmer, who's been in Warm Bodies, which is that karma, uh, horror comedy zombie movie, which actually I kind of liked. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Uh, the Grudge 2 and Wolf Creek. So she's got some horror chops there. So And I thought she was great in this film, actually. So And then uh, it's funny, though. One of the ones with the, some big horror chops is the, is the one that played Martin, the, the little brother. I guess he was in Annabelle. He was on American Gothic TV show, and I think he was in a couple other uh, horror themed shows there too. So it's and he was he was I thought he was pretty good as well. And uh, yeah, he was a lot of child actors. You had, you run that danger of being annoying, but he was really good. Yeah, no, he he was he was and he, he wasn't that one you're like oh that little bratty kid. No, he was good. It was as like I mean I wouldn't say he's Haley Joel Osment from The Sixth Sense good, but. He was good. <laughs> and uh, Maria Bello, I mean, she's got a huge resume. I mean, not much horror, but I think she did one horror movie, I guess, uh, The Dark. I Actually, I don't even know. I have to admit, I don't know if that's a horror movie. It just looked like it from the poster when I was looking through her thing. <laughs> but, uh, she, you know, she'd done a lot of comedies. Like, she did Grown Ups, uh, you know, some other ones. Uh, she was in Coyote Ugly. She did The Fifth Wave. Uh, she was in The Cooler, which was a great movie. That was a good, with William H Macy. That was that was a really good movie. If you haven't seen that, not horror, but really good. Um, and then I guess you had mentioned you knew recognized Billy Burke. Uh, oh yeah, I love Billy Burke. Yeah, so I guess he was. I, all I saw he was in the Twilight movies and some TV shows like Twenty Four. And he he's one of those he's one of those actors that you don't know his name but you know his face when you see him. Cause yeah, he's, he seems to be in all these different shows, and you go, oh, it's that guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's it's that, that guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, I love uh, Billy Burke. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought he was, I mean, he was, uh, albeit brief, role in it, but I recognized him, and I don't know what for, because I really 
I, I don't think I've seen more than five minutes of any of the Twilight films. <laughs> but he well, was, that's, his, well, that's his particular talent. You recognize him, but you don't know his name or where he's from. Right. He would he would make a, a horrible, like, a criminal because <laughs> he would be in every... Uh, they, even if he didn't do anything, he'd be implicated just because his face is familiar. Yep. But uh, <laughs> And then uh, the other main actor in there is Alexander de Persia. I, he was in I Am Legend, it says, and a bunch of TV shows. Uh, I don't know what he did, but I, I thought he's pretty good in it. So, I mean, I, I guess he's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about him, unfortunately, but he did good in this movie. So, so I guess uh, we can go into the, uh, get into the meat of this film, right? Yep. Let's go. Oh, actually, let's do the beer pairing oh, first. Oh, right, right. Well, as you'll get into the, uh, hopefully you've all seen this movie to get the, uh, get the beer pairing uh, reference, but there basically is uh, the main, uh, I guess, villain per se in this movie is uh, someone named Diana. And so I looked, I originally found the perfect beer, which I thought, which literally was called Lights Out Lager. Uh, and it was by a brewery called Treehouse, which I've had uh, a good sample of their beers. They're, they're not easy to get around my area, but every beer I've had from there was phenomenal. And they, so they had Lights Out Lager, but they actually, uh, I guess made it defunct. They stopped brewing it. <laughs> so I did not think that was fair. Not that I made this one any easier because this one is, is brewed in Bulgaria, supposedly. <laughs> but it's called huh. Diana Premium Lager by Boli Arca VT Brewery. So I, yeah. So have fun tracking that one down. But <laughs> but I couldn't resist. The, the hey, pairing. we're giving you a beer pairing. We didn't say it's going to be easy. That's true. Yeah. So far, we've let's see. We've given you the Manitou beer that you got to track down in some brewery in Colorado. Uh, do we give one that we could that anyone could find actually? <laughs> the one I, the one I gave last week was actually I think fairly that was Trinity. Oh right, right. So that yes. one should be fairly easy to get. Yeah, that that one is good. So there you got a good one. I mean, and we're not giving you Bud Light. I'll tell you that if that's what you're that's thinking right. of right now, then this is the wrong podcast for you because we <laughs> <laughs> we are not mentioning that. <laughs> so okay, so poor Billy Burke. Yeah, yeah. He starts off. Uh, this he's one. Well, actually, first you kind of. Uh, I guess he's sitting there. I guess he, yeah, he's starting uh, skyping with his son Martin, and the son you can kind of get this vibe that he's worried about his mother, and then and then the father kind of says, yeah, mo- your mother is sick. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we're kind of looking. You know, I guess he's kind of kind of assuring him he'll take care of it. But uh, and I guess he works at some kind of clothing factory. I, I, yeah, there's a lot of mannequins. Yeah, which is perfect for a horror movie. You know, nothing but mannequin. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the what, what I loved right away, and I recognized it right away, is he has one employee at the uh, that's there with him right now. He's working late apparently, and it's Lada Lustin, which is uh, as we mentioned, David Sandberg's wife, who starred in the yeah. original Lights Out. And I recognized her from the short. Yes, and so right away I'm like, oh, that's a good callback. I had no idea at that point that she was his wife. I just thought that was a good. You know, good cameo to throw back in there. Yeah, so she – and I thought it's kind of funny that she's the first person to experience the the, the 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 big thing in this film, which is where she turns the light off and she sees a shadowy figure standing there. And her reaction to the – and maybe it's because she's done these short films with her husband so much. She's, like, bored by it by this time. <laughs> right. Her reaction was not what my reaction would be. Now, her reaction is she turns the light off. She sees a shadowy figure. She turns it back on. She turns it back off again. She turns it back on. It gets a little closer. She lets out a small whimper of fear. Then goes in and tells Billy Burke, I saw something. You may be want to, may want to be careful on your way out. Yeah. Like, well, that was it. Yeah. Why was she so calm about that? I would have been peeing my pants, curled up in the fetal position, squ- squealing like a little girl. Yeah, and it, it's not like the the... the, the shadowy figure was just standing there looking you know up upright and and you know it looks like maybe just a regular person that might have walked in there no it's like got this slant to it and <laughs> it looks like a troll crone demon thing i mean it's scary yeah it's got light up eyes oh yeah basically something that you like i yeah i agree i would not just say oh yeah i saw something I'd say, like, you know what? I think we need to get out of here. I don't know what I saw, <laughs> but... Hey, uh, that that part, that whole sequence really bothered me, especially on the second viewing. I was like, oh, man, how in the world? Yeah, but I think you're right. I think that's what it was. She's just, you know what? She It's the second time she's encountered this thing. And <laughs> she's seen it in her short <laughs> film. Well, why, why, you know, 
but what's the difference? You know, <laughs> it was a good callback at work, but you know, yeah. So yeah, so then I guess um, she leaves, and you know, and the father I guess is wrapping up stuff, and then he goes out into his long. He's got a massive warehouse, I guess, of all these mannequins are kind of there, and he sees this figure now. So I think, and I think it it gets closer every time he flips the light on. I think, and yeah, right, yeah, I mean, they they play around with the setting, right? Yeah, because it, there's this long hallway, and the lights come on sequentially. So there's a lot of play with how the thing can move closer and closer as the lights come on and off. Right, and that's one of his 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 styles. But if you see some of his short films, they have a lot of that in it. So yeah, that's definitely that's all. David Sandberg style and and it works and it's great I I love it you know it's because there's nothing worse than you know it's bad enough when you know you see something that's planning to chase you and it's running but when it just kind of like warps <laughs> like yeah, 10 I'm, feet at a time even though I don't like jump scares I respect them because when they're done well they're they're brilliant. That was the only thing that really scares me in a horror movie is a well timed jump scare. Yeah, and so. yeah, and I he's book if he's not already a becoming a master of this. He does it well. Every one of them. Even though even when you think you know it's coming, he does it in a way that you're still kinda like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I definitely I, I was really digging this opening sequence because it, it is very creepy, it's very scary. Yeah, so so uh, what you expect? He goes and uh, he runs in. He I guess he grabs a bat, and as he's trying to to uh, g- I guess go defend himself against whatever he saw, the lights go out, and you see him yank through the door, and then he's like, I guess he's just dropped dead from the ceiling, and so that that's your opener, and you know it's a pretty good opening scene. I think it definitely sets the tone for the mil- the the film. It was very surprising to me because I thought Billy Burke would be the star of the movie. Yeah, well, because because he was so recognizable. Right, right. You know, you're like, oh, there's that guy, and oh, there he went. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it, and I gotta tell you, the one thing about this movie is it it, it moves pretty quick. You know, it, it really doesn't. It, it, it does. I mean, it gives us its typical horror exposition, but I think it does it pretty fast. Like the next thing, you, you kind of like jump right after that into. Uh, our main character, Becca, or Rebecca, but they call her Becca a lot, so I'm going to refer to her as Becca. And uh, she's there, and I, I put her guy right now because, as you know, right off the bat, she kind of has commitment issues. I mean, she doesn't let the poor guy keep his sock in the in the house. You know, I mean, he's, he seems like a good guy, and she just doesn't, like, she won't commit to him. So, <laughs> yeah. But, um, so, yeah, so I guess you introduce to her pretty quickly. I guess you see that she has scratches on her arm, which I guess a little, you know, just a little backstory that you'll you'll find out later, but um, then I, after you you meet her, you get to see, you get to meet Martin, which is uh, the little boy, and he's he's in his house, and he hears his mom talking to, which apparently is no one at the time, but then he sees the shadow over his doorway, which tries to get into his room, and it kind of then kind of it kind of cuts, I guess, to the next day where we see him in the school nurse's office, and they call his sister, which I thought was odd, rather than. The mother, but you find out later the mother's kind of got issues, so it kind of makes sense. And basically, the the social worker there, I guess, informs that Martin keeps falling asleep in class. And I don't know uh, how you can blame the kid. I mean, <laughs> based on what you find no, out, he's, he's living he, with. Yeah, he basically saw his mom talking to a shadow creature. So. Yeah, I, I think that might lose me a couple of hours of sleep myself. I don't know, you know. <laughs> yeah. And my mom talks to everybody, so you would think it wouldn't be it would be the norm, but no, yeah, yeah. Shadow creature would still kind of kind of mess me up a little bit, but <laughs> so and then so uh, so I guess Martin, you find that that's uh, Be- Becca's little brother. You find that they do have different uh, fathers. Uh, yeah, the they, uh, they're half siblings. Yes, half siblings, but you could tell that she really cares for her little brother, and he kind of tells her that mom's friend Diana is coming over, and. You know, I guess it triggers something in, in Becca because she's she she starts to calm him down and saying, "Oh, you know what? I had to. I had those same dreams when I was a kid. Don't worry, it's nothing." So you know, again later, um, I guess uh, Martin's startled again by that dark figure, and Becca comes over the house and just basically just you know gets mad at her mother and says, "That's it. He's he's not staying here. I'm taking him away." Because obviously the mother was kind of I guess she was loopy a little bit at that point. Well, you know she had been on pills and right. drugs for her 
issues. Right. So there was some question as whether she was still taking those or not. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, you could tell Becca just did not feel her was fit at that moment. So she she takes Martin back with her. Uh, the mother kind of does this. It's almost like a half-hearted. No, please don't take him. I mean, she doesn't want him, but I just don't think she has the strength to right. to to put up much of a fight. But um, so now you got uh, you, they're at Becca's apartment, and Becca wakes up into one of I think definitely one of the creepiest scenes in the movie. She just sees that dark figure kind of scratching on the floor of her apartment, and yeah. so she I guess she goes closer to investigate, and then. The creature kind of lunges, and she goes back, and while going back, she ends up in this, into her area, I guess her apartment had this red light on, <laughs> so it was light yeah. enough that I guess made the creature disappear, the figure disappear. So, so she figures out that this thing is repelled by light, or, or disappears when the light comes on. Right, whatever. right, so it's it pretty, I mean, at that point, you know, okay, the, she knows, the audience knows, kind of got I the mean, gist. I, I, should, I should point out. This movie is a one trick pony. Yes. But it's a very good trick. Yes, and they it, that's the thing. He does it. They do it over and over again. And yet and actually uh, my wife Julie did say that she goes, "Yeah, it's kind of the same thing over and over." <laughs> but but, uh, but I but the thing is that I, to me it worked well. I I didn't I didn't get tired of it happening. And actually yeah, it's, I, every every sequence where this happens where the old light goes on and off is still done so incredibly well that you're still nervous and scared because you know the Things gonna jump at you, right? And and as it, as the movie progresses, they do it a little bit different each time. And 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 there's times where you don't, you know, where she, the uh, the the well, you'll find out later. Her name, this is Diana, this this creature, and she uh, she can interact and and play around with the lighting herself. So, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, so uh, so basically, social services come over. Becca's apartment said, you know, listen, you can't just take your brother. <laughs> It's <laughs> basically you kidnapped him, <laughs> even though she meant yeah. well. But um, but here's where you kind of get the exposition to the backstory of this, which is done again. I said, you know, I think pretty well. It's pretty quickly the way it moves. And when she notices that what was etched on the floor was Di- it was the name Diana, and she has this flashback where she's, which is actually another one of these great jump scares, where she's drawing a picture of her dad, her mom, and her, and look, basic little stick figure drawing. And she hears a sound, turns around to look at it, and when she heads back to the picture, now there is a drawing. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The, the, it turns around, the, the drawing has now disappeared. So she hears a noise in the closet, goes to get the closet door open, and the picture drops down onto the floor as if someone was holding it. And she looks at it, and now there's a stick figure of Diana drawn into the family. So, you know, at this point, you kind of realize, okay, she just didn't have a dream when she was a kid. This was actually happened to her, and I think she's finally starting to realize it. So she goes to the mom's house and starts to really investigate. And so she finds out, I guess she finds this box and these files and a little tape recorder and finds out that both uh, her mom, Sophie, and uh, Diana were in a mental institution together. Uh, and I guess hearing the, the tape recorder, uh, it says that Diana was a violent patient. She had this rare skin condition and is super sensitive to light. And apparently this, through this interview, this doctor is having with Diana, who even as a child had a creepy voice, <laughs> it's like, rah, rah, <laughs> which I thought was, yeah, she was like, sounded like a uh, Reagan from the exorcist. Yes, that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly what it sounded like. So, <laughs> yeah, and I was like, okay, so she was just groomed from the start to be, uh, some kind of, uh, creature <laughs> in, in later life. But, um, so the, do- the doctor asked her a question, uh, why she hurt Sophie, which is the mother, um, and she said, well, because she was getting better. So, obviously, this Diana character is, definitely belongs in that mental institution, <laughs> As, uh, yeah. so yeah, and she got really attached to, uh, Sophie. Didn't well, want her one, to leave. One thing I should point out, Brian, uh, while we're going through this part is, uh, I liked that the audience found this stuff out as Becca did. Right, right. So you didn't have, you didn't have, you didn't have to resort to these crazy flashbacks. You didn't have to, I mean, there were some flashbacks, but it was as Becca was discovering this stuff. Yeah, and that's what I meant, you know, I was kind of referring to it before with the, the way they, they you you learn things through the movie. It, it's done in a really good way. It moves, it's quick, it's not, I'm going to stop this film and go to a flashback. No, like you said, she's finding it out as you're finding right. it out. 
or God forbid you have this this 10 minute conversation between an old doctor or something where she's like, do you know what happened to my mother? Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, and then they'll have them go for 10 minutes on and, and the audience is sitting there checking their watch. Uh, they they moved it right along by having you discover this along with Becca as she's as she's going through these things. Right. So that was pretty cool. And and that worked perfect because that's, I think, why this film does it. I mean, I, I think it's uh, what it's almost about two hours and but it does it, it moves pretty quick. You know, and I think this is the main reason. Okay, so then you find out that the doctors tried this very experimental light therapy procedure, and Diana was killed in the process. So now you got the pieces together why, <laughs> you know, why she's the way she is. So, and I guess Becca also finds that uh, the, the the drawing that she had in the flashback, and this was one of I remember in the theater where the audience was one of just like exploded with those those screams and when so the door slams behind becca and she's just yanked up by her hair up to the ceiling where you see now diana is hanging on the ceiling oh yeah it was so creepy yeah and i was like wow i said that's cool (laughs) you know and and again it's the same trick it's the it's nothing different than's happened the other time but it's done in a just enough different way that makes you you get excited so now here's where you start to really get. I'll, I'll try and I know I'm kind of going along with this a uh, little slow, but I'll try and pick this up. Uh, but so we get uh, so basically Martin and his mom uh, plan a movie night together, and he just wants her, him and his mom. No, Di- basically, for example, no Diana because Diana is essentially the mother knows Diana's around, and she you know she almost invites her to some level the son knows this now doesn't want to deal with she's, it she's the ultimate third wheel yeah big, <laughs> big time she, she's nobody like that wants her yeah nobody wants her around and so uh but she so she she actually this time tells martin why you know she's she tells her son she's like listen uh you know i feel bad i feel like i abandoned her and we need to keep the lights off so she could be around right there that to me that's a uh, <laughs> big red flag <laughs> You know, mom wants this this creature to be hanging around, so we're gonna turn all the lights off in the house. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's not like this thing looks like a real person. It looks like a troll, crone, witch, demon thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, it is creepy. It's not like it's like Marge from next door. You know? <laughs> yeah, see? it's not that. It's not the type of person you want to hang out Netflix and chill with. No, did you? But did you see? You know, the call back there. We brought Marge back for another episode. Yeah, that's right. Because you know, mention Marge in every episode. Yes, she will be. She will be. It used to be Manitou. Now it's going to be Marge. <laughs> but there again, I did the Manitou again. Perfect. So, <laughs> so uh, in our defense, Manitou is still our most popular episode. Yes, it was. It got more downloads this week, which is great. Yep. Wait, we, so. we, 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 yeah, we're gonna, uh, uh, and I actually have, uh, I'll, I'll tease it. There's basically a, uh, a Manitou uh, train station <laughs> discovered not too far from me, and so I am going to get there and put a, get a picture of that and put it on our Instagram, so to, to, to stay in theme with the Manitou love that our podcast is, is brought to the world, and uh, <laughs> so at this point, um, here's a, I thought this was a funny like, uh, fake scare where Becca's there with a. Uh, her, her, well, we'll just say boyfriend, uh, Brett, and there's a knocking on the door, and you, you expect it to be something creepy, and it's Martin somehow managed to get all the way to Becca's apartment. I mean, I don't know. They don't really say where either of them live, how far it is away, but I just thought it's, like, funny how he just shows up there. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, they, this time, Becca and Martin now are discussing Diana, and Martin tells Becca and Brett that Diana doesn't like the light. <laughs> and as we said before, at this point, doesn't that seem pretty obvious? <laughs> I mean, they all have experienced this now. I don't, you know. They're still all taking this much more casually than I would. Have. Right? Yeah, they're still, yeah, they're still, it's still pretty philosophical. Well, you know, she doesn't like light, so we'll just turn the light on, and there it goes. <laughs> but, but um, <coughs> oh, sorry, now see, I got, I got Tim's cough. We're both, we both have <laughs> a little spilkus uh, in our gazinkus <laughs> joint. To, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um. And you find out there that the the uh, the father was trying to find out more about this Diana character and when he was killed, which is Martin's father that is, uh, so uh, which is Becca's stepdad. So um, and they also find out that she get into people's heads, and she always seems to appear to Sophie when she's at her worst. So I guess when she so Becca kind of believes that if she can, if they can get her mother mentally strong, 
she can get rid of Diana. And Martin kind of just says, he's like, well, Diana will never let that happen. And basically, you know, kind of gives the example of the father again. So you're right there. You now you see they have a challenge. <laughs> and uh, so they um, then in another one of the, the cool scares, I guess they uh, they hear that knock at the door again. No one is there. And so Martin gets yanked under the bed, which was kind of a cool scene. And so they, they get him out and they, they decide they're going to go over to stay at the mother's house. And Becca goes right up to her mother and kind of tries to tell her all this is going on. She doesn't believe her. Um, I guess she doesn't believe the fact that Diana was going to harm them is what it, what I took from that, right? Is that? Yeah, the, the mother seems to be in denial that even though Diana actually hurt her in real life. When right. They were younger. She still defends her like she has this this. She does, yeah. I think her her words were she didn't mean it, she right? Didn't mean it, or she doesn't mean to, or she she's very defensive of Diana, right? Yeah, I th- I think it was yeah, it was more the, the and, and the guilt she feels, and you know, it just overtakes her her ration her the, the basically being rational about the whole thing <laughs> that uh, this 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 person that comes only when it's dark and is tormenting her children. But, you know, she didn't mean it, you know. <laughs> so um, so they all de- – basically they all decide to stay over and th- this scene I cracked me up. I wrote this on a note because they basically start prepping the house similar – I said it's like a horror home alone. Um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they start putting like, – I mean the only thing missing is little matchbox cars, which I don't think yeah. would do anything. But <laughs> Yeah, duct tape on the light switches and – Yeah, I think they put candles out. They got a whole bunch of bulbs. So stupid wind up flashlight. Yeah, of course, you know, because you know that's going to come into play at some point. Uh, so I'm like, I don't. Know, I, let's get a flashlight that takes a long time to charge. Right. Yeah. Of course. You know, it's like I mean, because, I mean, it would make sense that they had one of those those uh, long lasting halogen ones. You figure they could probably stop at a Home Depot on the way over here. But now they decide to just go with what they have, and <laughs> <laughs> so they they set it up. Um, yeah, you know, Martin wants Becca to stay with him in the room because he's still a little uh, jittery, I guess. Brett gets uh, put on the couch, and uh, but here's here's where it starts to I, I, it starts to get interesting. I think uh, where uh, Sophie really starts to realize the danger as she as she says goodnight to Becca, she slips her a note that says, "I need help." So Becca's looking for her mother's medicine that will kind of ease this, but cannot find it. So. Anyway, so the, that gets all set up, and then, of course, the power goes out. So, Brett decides to go outside to check outside, and Becca decides it's a good idea to go into the basement. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, why Why not? You know, <laughs> I mean, they have this dark basement. Uh, of course, that's where I'll go in there. So, in, in a in a funny scene, I thought, I, I mean, not funny, funny, but, you know, where they're like, they're like why, would she, why would we, uh, she lead us down here, and then... Becca realizes because it's a trap, and soon enough, you see Diana at the top of the stairs, slamming and locking the basement door, trapping them in there. So, and this is this part is one of my favorite sequences, and this is the part the theater literally exploded at again, where Brett gets attacked outside. And now, yes, I gotta this tell was a great you, scene. yeah, and I gotta tell you, I thought he was toast. He was set up the entire movie to have to get killed, but yet he's smart enough. He Right as he's about to get attacked, he first uses his cell phone light, flashes it just enough to brighten brighten the area, and he gets away. But this part is even better. He gets attacked again and is literally getting held up in the air. And he grabs his key fob and clicks the car, which shines the, the headlights and disappear, makes Diana disappear and it drops. Yeah, and you, you see this great shot of him actually suspended in midair. Yeah. Until the right after the lights come on, and then he just drops to the ground. Yeah, and like t- and typical teenage, uh, the teenage girls in the theater. I guess they had this thing for the for the boyfriend, and so they all screamed and like applauded. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious, but it, it I, yeah, part of me wanted to also. It was a great scene. It was it was it was in- inventive based on all the other ways that you know with the light you figure he's he's doomed and he finds a way to to, to survive it. So, because his character doesn't really do a whole lot throughout this, he's kind of a supporting character to Becca, but he's not really involved in the plot or anything. No, he's just kind of there. He's just, he's just, yeah, he's just a good guy. Yeah, I mean, so it's he seems like cannon fodder from the beginning, right? You, you, I assumed he was, he was going to be dead, uh, right? For, for, right from the beginning, on. I, in fact, I thought after he 
she threw the sock at him. That was like the sign, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but um. So anyway, so he gets uh. So then Diana seems to be kind of getting all over the house at this point because he starts. She starts fighting with Sophie, and Sophie tries to take her pills to hopefully, I guess, rid Diana for a while, and she just swats them out of her hand. Pills go everywhere. So. And I think it, like, actually knocks her out, I think, at one point. Because then they, they cut back to the basement, and uh, Becca finds this, this cool black light that she's holding and walking around like a lightsaber. <laughs> yeah, because she's, she figures out that the black light does not scare Diana, so she can actually see where she is. Right. Using the black light, which is kind of a cool gimmick from a cinematography point of view, because you have these great cool shots of this black light being shown around right and and they used it again to kind of just make a creepy vibe in the room because you see this writing on the walls and there's like and there's handprints and so they kind of really like she could really follow uh you know it, it was just yeah like you said it was a it's just a cool technique to kind of use a cool black light imagery and then in a scene where even though you know this thing is what's gonna about to happen it still got me Every time I've seen it, where she's searching through and she comes across this row of creepy mannequins. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so she's looking and looking, and sure enough, the last one's got just, it's facing the wall. So sure enough, it turns around, it's Diana. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that one got me too, and I've seen this movie twice. Yeah, now, every it time. Both times. And you know what, it, you know what's coming. And even the first time I saw it before I knew that was going to happen, you know it's coming. And it still was so well done that it gave you that jump. And now, I will say... One of my biggest pet peeves in movies is showing too much. Right. And this is where they start showing a little too much for my taste in Uh-oh. terms of Diana. Yeah. Because the, Di- the Diana creature is super scary when you see her as just a silhouette. Right. But when they start showing close-ups of her, you see that it's more kind of a, has kind of a Halloween witch type look to her right that I, I didn't care for. Yeah. I, I, it would, yeah. You didn't, I don't think you need to, needed to see, uh. The, the, fa- the yeah her face too much it was it was great the way it was when you couldn't tell you just knew she was creepy and you, and you know you saw what she was what you thought she would look like anyway a little bit when from the in the flashback you know, or the the scene where they showed a picture of her i guess as a child but um and it's funny if you look at the actress that actually played her <laughs> she's like this blonde uh normal looking person so it's like it, it it's it's funny it's like it, it, you know it's just the caked on makeup of it yeah I, I agree i don't think they needed to to show that and in the original if you remember that you, you see the face for literally like i think what two seconds and yeah, that's but it. it's a, it's a way different oh yeah the the, the, the short uses a, almost like a, a monster creature type effect yeah this was definitely more humanoid which i gotta tell you i think i i in the short it's that the face scared me more in the short Oh, did. by far, yeah, <laughs> by far. That thing. I, I wish they. I wish they had used that thing. Yeah, I, I would have. I, yeah, but I. I mean, I see why they didn't. I guess it wouldn't. I mean, I don't know what that was in, the, in the short. I don't know how they could work a story around it, but yeah. Right. But um, yeah. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, they they showed a little too much, but then and then here's an interesting twist. So she well, first she burns her with the in the on the arm, with uh, with the, with the the neon light. And so now here's the thing that that confused me though it didn't think that it didn't seem like you could interact with diana other than by flipping the light off but now you can i guess becca found a way way to but like if you took a light bulb would that do the same thing or is it just that specific light i couldn't tell i'm not sure i think yeah i mean this is where the movie started to break down a little bit for me yeah i mean if they if i I wouldn't necessarily call a, a a true plot hole but there's that de- i mean and this, this movie has few of those but that one um i think that's the one i was just confused that i don't think they set see here's the thing most horror movies you know usually good horror movies will it will kind of have that set of rules and you know and as long as they stick to the rules no matter how outlandish they are i'm fine with it yeah, but, that's true for any genre. Well, yeah, really. yeah, true. Yeah, it really is in anything. As long as you stick to the rules that you establish and you don't do some contrived twist that makes no sense based on everything else, I'm fine with it. So, I, I yeah, I mean, not that I wanted them to stop and make a whole scene out of it, but I just wish you understood a little bit more the rules that Diana has. Like, what, like, you know, she, she obviously can't be shot, but she can get hit by a, a physical light, which. Yeah, so I, I don't know the rules of that. So, I mean, it, there's a little bit of a, lo- a looseness to the plot on that point. But, and, 
So I don't know. But so then Brett returns with the police and <laughs> which yeah, here's a funny twist to this. If you think about it, all these like supernatural horror films, the police are brought in and it's usually at the very, very end and usually to clean up some the whole aftermath of it, not truly understanding what's going on. But here the police and and, and, and Julie brought this up too. the police are involved in this now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so it that's it's weird that they're kind of they're in this thing and they're going in there looking because they they say it's a d- domestic disturbance supposedly. And for, sure enough, within like about three seconds, the the first police officer is killed. So then, <laughs> then the other police officer goes in there, and this is the part I don't understand. She was walking in light first. How th- I don't know how she got killed. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a, I mean, you do bring up a good point because they actually. The, the police now become part of the body count. Right. And which usually, is always fun. Yeah, but, I mean, I, yeah, and Friday the 13th and, my, and Halloween knows where there's a physical person involved doing this killing. It, it makes more sense. But this was, a, you know, a rarer in the supernatural mm-hmm. type usually of Usually they're, they're the ones that come in and nothing happens and they're like, oh, yeah, right, lady. Right. And I thought that was, was a pretty cool twist, though. I did think, even though, again, it, I think – Without rules for exactly how Diana's working in this, I don't understand how how she got killed. Because yeah, they had lights. Right. The police had lights. Remember he said, you're going to need lights. And they were like, you, you leave it to us. Yeah. And they went in with lights anyway. Yeah. And and, the thi- and they were like the ones I was talking about. They should have gotten the first place. <laughs> so obviously I gave bad advice because they got killed, the cops. <laughs> pretty good. Although the second cop got killed pretty cool, though, when she just comes out like. With the, the mangled face, I guess, and she's dead. So, so uh, I guess Becca at this point uh, wants to just leave the house, but the but uh, her brother Martin will not leave without the mother. So she says, "All right, I promise to get her out." So Brett, being the good guy again, takes out Martin, and Diana uh, gets attacked by Becca and literally just throws her down the stairs. So, and she reveals to her that she killed Becca's father as well, which I think earlier in the film they said he was just he left. She said that he ran out. Right, he ran out because she was obviously not, sh- you know, she was young enough not to know what happened. But, yeah, so now you find out that, okay, this is not the first time when someone tried to find out about Diana, they paid for it. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, Sophie shows up and says she's going to shoot Diana because she messed with her kids. And that was the one rule, apparently, that she, she wasn't supposed to do. And... Diana kind of challenges, says, oh, yeah, well, you can't hurt me. So Sophie decides the only way to uh, stop this is by turning the gun on herself and killing herself, which basically cuts Diana's ties to the living world. Yeah, classic uh, exorcist uh, sacrificing yourself uh, to to kill, to kill slay the demon. Yes, and for the, for the good of Tims everywhere that don't like jump scares, they... Save yep. the day. <laughs> good, good riddance, Diana. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, I mean, so basically, what what thought, uh, overall, like, uh, what would you think of the characters in the film? Uh, I did not dislike this movie, because I do appreciate the jump scares for what they were, and the, and the creepiness and the gimmick I liked. Um, I think it suffered a little bit from being a PG-13 because it has that kind of mainstream PG-13 feel. And people, if you're a horror fan, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's got, there's this certain feel to these PG-13 movies that there's some safe boundary there that you know it when you see it. Yeah, I, yeah, the PG-13s have done done a lot of damage to to the horror film. So I didn't, I appreciated the film for the scares Uh, I thought it was entertaining. Uh, There was elements of it that I really liked. But overall, I would say, I don't know, I I would give it maybe a a 7 out of 10 on the high end. Yeah. Six and a half, seven. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I I would probably give it up. Maybe I would just nod a bit uh, higher. But it may have been maybe like an 8 out of 10, 8 and a half out of 10. Maybe because... By seeing it in the theater, I had a, an overall better first experience of it. So that yeah, m- that might have that might have helped, but I mean, what I what some of the the, the points that I, I like about it though is the fact that when you have the you know you have that couple Brett and Becca, the you know the usually one of them, one of them usually is going to get killed off, but 
both of them are pretty resourceful in the movie, which is which is kind of a little twist. Usually one of them is always kind of getting saved by the other. And this, they kind of both saved themselves, <laughs> which is... Well, I, I think everything we're talking about, which is the those little little twist and the 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 way the plot moves along or you can credit all that to the writer yeah the who we've already said obviously has good writing chops so that's just an example of good writing this this film could have been handled by a lesser writer and been much inferior because it wouldn't have included that kind of stuff oh right yeah it could have easily based on if you think about the plot it's a very you know it's a very hokey plot but I think the the by seeing the a great version of it in that little short film, and then taking all the best of that short film and and still using it in the big film, that that uh, I think that was that was a plus as well. So, and did you now did you happen to watch I, on the, the Blu Ray? They have the alternate ending. Did you watch that? I did not see. No, I did not watch the alternate ending. Okay, because the alternate ending is actually I'm glad they did not use it. Because basically what it is, the alternate ending, is they're back at Becca's apartment and Diana comes back for some reason and attacks Brett and looks like he like finishes him off. So Martin and Becca, who were there also, they ju- I guess they, they jump over to a switch that she, she flips and literally the ceiling is covered with light bulbs. And then this other giant halogen light comes on from the side and... And eliminates Diana for good that way. And <laughs> Brett, who I thought was dead, no, he did not die again. <laughs> he comes out and it ends there. So I'm glad they chose with the ending they did where it just... Because it is a pretty dark ending. Right. So it was, a, it was yeah. a bold choice, I will say. Right. For, especially I mean, for a PG-13 movie. Yeah, like the mother literally shoots herself. Now you realize this kid is essentially an orphan. I mean, he obviously is going to get taken care of by his sister, who... Which is probably why they establish how much she cares for him. So you kind of get that little bit of like, okay, he'll be okay. But, yeah. But now yeah. there is a there is a sequel to this coming out, right? Yeah, but I could I was looking, I couldn't find much of a plot on that. Did you Did you see anything on based on the plot? I mean, it's no, hard. I'm, so they I could, had heard that there was a sequel, and this may have been a while back. I had heard there was a sequel coming out, but no, I have not seen any details. Right, and since it's horror, I mean, there are countless ways they could bring her back. So it's, yeah, I mean, which is even more the reason why I'm glad they did not do the uh, the alternate ending that they had, which you should watch on DVD. It's, cause it's almost like comical in a way <laughs> with all the lights. It reminds me of that sequ- scene in, in Funny, which we mentioned earlier, that the Jason goes to hell <laughs> when they, they when the, the, all the, the army people like set that trap for him. And oh, all yeah. the lights Although, go... Choo, choo, choo. The way you're describing it, I'm surprised they didn't use that ending. Because for for this type of mainstream PG-13 movie, that's exactly the kind of ending I would have expected. Right, which is why I, I think, too, that actually made me appreciate the, the movie as a whole more after seeing that ending. I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm glad they didn't do the the silly ending, you know? So, so that was good. All right, well, let's move on to last week's trivia question. Yes. And uh, as you recall, that was Night Warning. And the trivia question was, which notable action movie writer, director, producer, and cinematographer worked for one week on this film and only did the car accident decapitation scene? And the answer is the great Jan DeBont from Die Hard. Yes. And he did the speed films. So he obviously definitely yeah. has that. Now you see why that car scene worked well. Yeah. <laughs> He yeah, knew his stuff. So he's one of the, one of the greats. Yes, so, and that's so funny because I did not know he was around back then doing stuff. So because that was pretty. What was it? Eighty two, right? Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Yep. Seventy. What? No. What? Yeah. What? Night warning was eighty two. Eighty two. Yep. Yeah. So that was mm-hmm. that was. And when did Die Hard come out again? Eighty eight. I want to say. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So I mean, you see, he wasn't. Um, he definitely was not. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I hadn't heard him at that point for sure. So. So that's interesting, though. So that I hopefully hopefully that was a good trivia question for you guys out there. So all right, and what's the trivia question for this week? Ah, yes. Okay, so the house. Uh, and when we say house, we refer to uh, the mother's uh, Sophie's house. In Lights Out was used in two other recent horror films. Name those films. All right, there's a good one. Yeah, so that that'll give you some something to look up. 
Now you're going to watch every horror film in your repertoire. and uh, Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, i got 40 to go through, so. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. By the way. Uh, it's not Halloween 2. <laughs> no, not Halloween 2. I, I did pick up, a, you may have seen it, I posted it on Twitter. I picked up the Frankenstein Legacy Collection. Oh, yeah. i got to get those. So I'm really excited about that. And that's not the Frankenstein that uh, created the bikers or whatever, right? No, it's not that one. <laughs> okay. This is, this is the old school. Ah, so, yes. Hopefully, classic. I'll have a re- how I'll have some uh, impressions of that set for you at some point. You know, if I ever, if I may ever make it down to the F's. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, well, yeah, and that that's one you kind of probably gonna want to watch in in sequence. Watch the whole like the whole pack. Yeah, and I've seen most of those films already, but I, I want to go through the features, and they even some of them have audio commentaries, which I think is really cool. Oh wow, that's a, yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, usually you don't get I mean, those. No, for the uh, old I mean, ones. it's not like it was the people in the 1930s recording the audio commentary on a record player i know right is that like, <laughs> i hope it's not that because although that would it's be not funny. the original people but yeah can you imagine that back then it's like yeah yeah we, we got this monster see we got it we got them yeah. it'd be like the kong people i don't know who's gonna listen to this but at some point they may find a way to reproduce this film yeah. <laughs> otherwise just make sure that every time you bring go to the theater you bring this record player <laughs> but anyway so that should be fun but uh Thanks, thanks, guys, for listening. Our downloads are increasing. Uh, we're getting some good comments and feedback. I uh, really appreciate it. You can find us on Twitter at Civil Gore Pod. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Civil Gore Podcast. And you can find us on Gmail at Civil Gore Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we're also on Instagram. Yes. And... Be sure to leave us an iTunes review if you would be so kind, as that really helps uh, get the word out about us. Yes, and if you do follow us on Twitter, I I, I try and uh, try and uh, share some uh, cool stuff every now and then as well, and hopefully that'll uh, let people know about our show. And if you you know if you like it, and you, even if you don't, uh, you know you know along with the uh, the iTunes reviews, if you see you know you know a friend or someone that may like hearing two guys talk about some horror movies hey let them know yep so we're gonna wrap it up we'll be back next week with another movie and i've got one picked out we'll see if brian agrees oh nice uh, I'm but excited. it's one that has a has a little personal connection to me so oh i think i know what it might be yep so we'll uh we'll see you then all right take it easy guys <laughs>